we begin this hour in the state of Georgia, where Leilani Simon is charged with the murder of her 20-month-old son. You might remember he went missing in 2022, only for his body to be found a month later at a local landfill. Well, Leilani Simon was back in court Tuesday for a pivotal pre-trial hearing. Before we bring you those key moments, here's a little refresher on the case. Court TV anchor Julia Janae reports. Little Quentin Simon was just 20 months old when he was last seen in his home in Savannah, Georgia on October 5th, 2022. He lived with his mother, Leilani Simon, her boyfriend, Danny Youngkin, and his grandmother, Billy Joe Howell. My boyfriend woke up, saw the child at 6 a.m. Mother woke up at some other time later uh, and they reported the child missing at 9.39, I believe the call came in at 9.00. Local police and FBI begin searching for Quentin that very day. Uh, we have yet to locate uh, little Quentin. Uh, we continue to investigate this incident. Um, we got some assistance from the FBI. Uh, we got numerous interviews to conduct today, um, as well as downloading uh, phones and things of that nature. Leilani Simon tells police that Quentin's biological father, Henry Bubba Moss, took him. So authorities go to Bubba's home more than an hour away. He was being questioned about uh, where he was uh, overnight, uh, October 4th into October 5th, and um, uh, proved uh, to police satisfaction anyway that, that he had nothing to do with it. Has there been any contact with Quentin's biological father? Uh, we have had contact with him. He's not a suspect in this case. After a week of searching for little Quentin, the Chatham County Police confirms everyone's worst fear. Quentin is believed to be dead, and his mother, Leilani, is the primary suspect, but no charges or arrests are made. What are you doing? What is going on here? Where's the FBI? Where's Secret Service? Somebody needs to find this baby and lock her up. After that announcement, all eyes turn to Leilani. Protesters, podcasters, and YouTubers gather outside of her home day and night. Nearly three weeks after Quentin was reported missing, Leilani and her mother finally speak out in an interview with WTOC News. And if something does come up that I am at fault, I will take myself to that police station. Then 47 days after Quentin vanished, law enforcement find remains of a human child in a local landfill and they arrest Leilani Simon. Our search teams at the waste management landfill found what they believed were human remains. This afternoon, the FBI lab in Quantico, Virginia, confirmed that they are, in fact, human remains. Additional testing, including a DNA analysis, is being conducted, and we have every reason to believe that this will confirm the remains are Quentin's. That was Julia Janae reporting there. Now let's get you into Tuesday's important pretrial hearing. It all centered around a defense motion to suppress previous statements made by Leilani Simon. There was only one witness called to the stand. That's Detective Marion Lemons with the Chatham County Police Department. And in this portion, the detective describes her background knowledge of Leilani Simon. Before we get into uh the particular facts surrounding the defendant's various statements in this case. I want to ask you some background, uh, about some background information that will help, I think, set the scene, okay? Okay. Um, in the general time period in question, we'll say fall of 2022, um, where was the defendant living? So it is a uh, address off of Buckholter Road, 535 Buckholter. And is that in Chatham County? It is. Generally speaking, what area of town is it? Uh, we refer to it as the west side of town, as right off of Okichi Road. Can you describe, um, just briefly, I'm not asking you to give like a full layout or full yeah. plan, but can you briefly describe the residence? Yeah, it's a uh, single family home, um, two stories uh, with a fenced in backyard. And how many bedrooms does it have? It has uh, four bedrooms, but one of them is more been converted into a bedroom. It's probably a living room for Okay, but has been converted into a yes. bedroom? Okay. And who, I don't know whether you said already, whose residence is that or was that at the time, I guess? So it was owned by uh, Billy Joe Howell and her husband, Thomas. And who are they in relation to the defendant? Uh, Billy Joe is Leilani's biological mother. And what about Thomas? Her stepfather. Okay. Um, at the time period in question, who else, I think we were up to three people now, the defendant, 
uh, her mother, Billy Joan, her stepfather, Thomas Howell. Who else, if anyone, was living in that residence at that in that general time period, fall of 2022? Yeah, so Mrs. Howell's um, other son, Paul Simon, lived there as well. He lived upstairs. And then Leilani's boyfriend at the time, Daniel Youngkin, and then her three children. The defendant's three children? Yes. And uh, who were they, like give the rundown of their names and ages. So Zane is her oldest. Um, he was three during the time of this incident. And then there's Quentin, who was about 20 months old. And then Skye, who was uh, five months, I believe. And Skye was uh, the baby that had been born of the defendant's relationship with Daniel Youngkin? Yes. Her, her then boyfriend? Yes. Uh, the other two children uh, were the products of previous relationships the defendant had had. Is that right? Okay. Um, I think you mentioned that Paul slept in a bedroom upstairs. Yes. And that the defendant lived in a bedroom downstairs that appeared to be a converted living room or something like that. Yes, that's where her Daniel and the three children lived. Okay, so all five of them lived in that room? Yes. Okay. Um, and did that room have uh, any door that opened directly to the outside? Yeah, the, um, the side where the children were, it led to the front door, which is an exterior door, leading to uh, the buckholder side of that residence. Okay, and this is, is this the door that people in this family refer to as the front door? It is. Um, they call it the front door, but it opens directly into their bedroom. Yes. And does that appear to be a consequence of the fact that this bedroom is a converted living room? Yeah, Mr. Lillier. I object. I don't as to the relevance. My understanding is we're here for a Jackson Denno hearing. I don't really understand the reason for the biological history lesson we're being given right here, but I don't see the relevance to what we're here for today. Mr. Dean. Your Honor, we have the burden of establishing that all of the statements that the defendant gave were voluntary. Um, for the court geographical residence doesn't do anything to, to establish. If, if I may Thank you, Mr. just finish my response. Mm -hmm. um, it is going to be necessary for us to do a certain amount of scene setting um, for the court to understand what these state statements were, what she was talking about, and the general investigative context in which they were made. Um, if the defendant wants to stipulate that they were all voluntary, uh, then certainly the inquiry uh, would at that point probably become less searching. Uh, but we have a burden and we intend to carry it, not ask for a little attitude. Mr. Dean, um, I'm going to give you a little latitude. Um, I am not overruling the objection. I am overruling the objection, but I want you to rein it in okay. because I do understand the objection about where we are right now. Now, um, Let's go to the evening of uh, October 4th slash, like the night of October 4th slash morning of October 5th, okay? Yes. Um, who was actually present in the home on that day? So it was Paul Simon, um, Lilani Simon, Daniel Yonkin, and- You have an objection, Your Honor, as to relevance. He's getting into his case in chief at a motion hearing as to the voluntariness of certain statements. If I may, Your Honor, this has nothing to do with the cameras. The court will remember that I've objected to every media request in this case. The very next thing that I'm going to get into is that it was the defendant who drew law enforcement to her residence by making a false report of a crime and representing this as a child abduction. Now that bears on voluntariness. It bears on the voluntariness of their statements that day and all the ones that followed is that she was she brought the police attention on herself to misrepresent what she had done. This is really not very far. This is not a far afield at all. Mr. Hillier. Your Honor, that's called his conclusory statements as to what the evidence reflects. It doesn't have anything to do with the voluntariness of a statement. If Mr. Dean wants to sit here and say, she called him to her, her house, she gave the statement, it was voluntary, that's fine. As far as the way he paints the evidence, though, that's, a, that's better made in closing statements after a trial, and that's not what we're here for. Mr. Dean, I tend to agree with the defense on this. Let's go straight into what the evidence is and, and proceed from there. 
Oh boy, oh boy, it looks to me like Leilani Simon is in big, big trouble. Let's bring in our guest and talk more about it. Criminal defense attorney Michael Riley on the program and criminal defense attorney and former prosecutor Matthew Mangino. Great to see you both on this Wednesday. Oh my, okay, uh, let's talk about how concerned Leilani Simon should be over the death of her young son, Quentin Simon. This this is just a horrific case. It's sickening, uh, really upsetting. I want to get your both uh, both of your, you know, kind of general thoughts on this case before we get specific. Uh, Mike Riley, would you start us off, please? Sure. Thanks so much, Julie. Um, I think Leilani Simon should be very concerned. Um, the, the investigation is focused on her since the very beginning. She's reached out to the police. She's made several statements. She's made several statements that contradict themselves. Uh, she's now charged in the gruesome murder of young Quentin Simon, and the state seems to have quite a bit of evidence against her. Mm, yeah, they sure do, Mike. Uh, her statements, her statements are a big problem, aren't they? Matthew Mangino, your thoughts, please. Well, yeah, she, she does have uh, some serious problems uh, with this case. Uh, primarily, you know, she voluntarily called the police and got the police involved in this and then spoke to them without an attorney. And certainly you're not going to uh, get an attorney if you're portraying yourself as a victim here, the mother of, of a victim. So, uh, but, but her continuing to talk with the police after uh, the initial contact is problematic. And, you know, what we're talking about here is a suppression motion. And, and what were any of these custodial interrogations? And that's the threshold. It has to, you have to be in custody and you have to be interrogated in order for a suppression motion to work. And that's what we're going to find out uh, during the course of this hearing. Exactly. Matthew, thank you for that. Uh, was the cover-up worse than the crime? I mean, in... Please don't misunderstand. We know that a child death, there's nothing worse, you know, baby being killed. And the allegation is that he was assaulted with an unknown object before little Quentin was dumped in a landfill. Uh, the cover up that happened after the fact, you know, to mislead police. Uh, Matthew, you touched on this, the making a false report. Uh, Mike Riley, do you think this almost makes it worse? Do you think these facts, uh, the cover up facts might inflame this jury even more? Absolutely, Julie. I think Leilani Simon only made things worse for herself by her efforts to cover things up, um, going to the media, making reports that Quentin's biological father may have abducted the child, all of these different statements trying to, to take herself out of it um, and, and suggest that she had nothing to do with it and that she was just a victim. Um, I think that, that her statements don't add up and a jury's going to see these statements and think, wow, she really was trying to hide something. Uh, and that's what we call consciousness of guilt. It suggests that she had something to hide, that she did something wrong. Uh, and that's not going to bode well for her at trial. Not at all. Mike Riley, Matthew Mangino, thank you both for the insight. Stand by kindly, please. When we come back, prosecutors play the 911 call placed by baby Quentin's father the day that he went missing. We're going to hear this key piece of evidence together, and it includes a frantic Leilani Simon. That's next. As a mom, I think that if this happened to me, knock on wood, I would hope that it wouldn't, uh, I would come out and say something. You know, can y'all help me find my kids? You know, but you're not. You're going to Tabby, and you're drinking, and you're partying. Like, what are you doing? What is going on here? Where is the FBI? Where is Secret Service? Somebody needs to find this baby and lock her up. Lock them all up because the grandma had custody. So if the grandma has custody and she left her with them, she's just as at fault. We're talking about little baby Quinton Simon and bringing you Tuesday's pretrial hearing for his mother in what we're calling the landfill murder case. So the attorneys for defendant Leilani Simon presented a motion to suppress previous statements that she made. These were in the days and the weeks after her son's disappearance. She was interviewed numerous times by police. And at the heart of this case is the 911 call placed by her then boyfriend and little Quentin's father on the day that he went missing. This is a moment that was played in open court. Let's watch. How did the police 
initially become involved in the disappearance of Lucky Side? So we received a 911 call on October 5th, um, and the call was made by Daniel Youngkin and Leilani Simon. Okay. Um, what time was that uh, 911 call? It was at 9.38. And this was on the morning of October 5th, right? It was. Uh, and you said it was made by Daniel Youngkin and Leilani Simon? Yes, they're both heard on the 911 call. Okay. And what was the, um, what was the nature of the call? Um, it was mainly Daniel um, speaking, uh, but basically he was saying that they could not find their 20-month-old son and that the front door was open. And the defendant herself could be heard on portions of that call as well, is that right? She can. Okay. Um, this has been introduced uh, as State's Exhibit 1, Your Honor, and at this time I've asked to publish this to the court. And, and you have tendered 1 through 32. Is there any objection to those exhibits coming in? Not for the limited purposes of this hearing, Judge, no. So I understand the court has to look at them and hear them and see them. But, you know, so as far as this hearing, no, Your Honor, no objection. It, it would be for the limited purpose of this hearing. Right, of course. All right. Thank you, Mr. Dean. All right. May we now publish that to the one? Yes. 3837 second October 5, 2022. Hello. 711, what was your emergency? Yeah, I'm just from the 585 Buck Halter Road. I was released from the kidnapping. 535 Buck Halter? Yeah. Can you say someone? They kidnapped? She wanted the police to come to her house. Yes. Um, sometime after that phone call, did patrol officers respond? They did. And did they make contact uh, with the defendant? Yes. Where did they make contact with the defendant? So on the right side of the house is the main driveway, um, which the family kind of uses as their, their front entrance area. Um, so the family was waiting there. Okay. Um, if we could please publish State's Exhibit 2. This is an excerpt from uh, some body-worn camera footage of responding officers. Okay, without objection, please proceed. Hey, you can uh, take Marine 3 on the board. If you have to fly out yesterday, it's all good. I woke up a lot better call. I was in the floor at six. So I'm doing three-hour period. So I have a front door. So look at my son is not in his life yet. The three-year-old son's there, the daughter's there. He can't get out of the place by himself. He cannot. He can't even open doors. Yeah, I left for work at 6 o'clock. She called me at 9 o'clock. And 
Fred was on my side. He's gone. Right. And, and she said about, about two weeks ago, she, she, told, she, told, she told us that she's seen a car sit out front about two weeks ago. You can talk um, with your partner. Yeah. Um, so in this clip, we see that the defendant met the patrol officers in the driveway, right? Yes. Or she came to them. Yes. Um, and they hardly had to ask her any kind of question at all. Um, she just started talking. Yes. Mm, what'd you think of that call? What do you think of Leilani Simon? Stand by, my friends. We're going to hit a break. When we come back, we're going to see prosecutors introduce a series of recorded police interviews with the defendant after that frantic 911 call. After the break, she details the last time she saw her son, Quentin. We'll talk about it next. Welcome back to Core TV Live. I'm Julie Grant. Let's get you back into Tuesday's big hearing in the landfill murder case. The victim, little toddler, Quinton Simon. Now, there was questioning of case detective Marion Lemons during this hearing. You're going to see her on the stand. And prosecutors, through her testimony, introduced a series of recorded interviews with defendant Leilani Simon, the child's mother. Now, this was conducted by a responding officer on the scene. And in the portion that we're about to watch together, Leilani Simon recalls the last time that she saw her 20-month-old son. At some point, did uh, detectives show up. They did. And uh, who were the first detectives on scene for the Chatham County Police Department? It was Detective Wilkins and Detective Melvin. Uh, and did they interview uh, some of the people that were on scene? They did. Uh, the defendant? Yes. Daniel Youngkin? Yes. And I think also Paul Simon, the brother? I believe so. Okay. Uh, was that interview um, recorded? Yes, it was. How was it recorded? So I think part of it was captured on the patrol officer's body cameras, and then the rest was on a handheld audio recording device. Now, um, those interviews, uh, I'll just note for the court, are included, um, that interview is included as State's Exhibit 3 in, in the exhibits that have been, uh, been admitted. Uh, now, did they ask her, did she tell them when she had gone to bed and when she had woken up? Yes. Okay. Uh, can we please publish State's Exhibit 3 starting at 2 minutes and 10 seconds in? Or thereabouts. Yeah, that's fine. Phone number two. Uh, where's your fiance? That's him? I'll be with you in just a second, sir. I'm just going to ask you a few questions once I'm done with her, okay? All right. So when's the last time you saw your child? When I went to bed last night. And what time was that? Do you remember? around 12. 12? Okay. 12 when I went to bed. I had my wisdom teeth removed yesterday. I'm sorry. That sucks. <laughs> so I went to bed kind of... Late. I get you. <laughs> Listen, I had enough too. So I got up this morning about nine. About nine? And my front door is open, so I went up and I shut it, not thinking about anything mm -hmm. like that. And I look over and check on my kids, and he was gone. All the rest were there. He, he was it's gone. It's all right. It's all right. It's all right. <laughs> take, take some deep breaths. I'll start asking. Stop right, we stopped the playback at 257. Um, so she spoke to Detective Wilkins willingly, right? She did. Um, he didn't have to force anything out of her? No. Uh, and she told him that she had gone to bed at midnight, is that yes. right? Or, or around midnight? Yes. Okay. Um, at some point, did officers on scene, uh, well, let me ask you this. Did she have a car at this time? She did. What type of car? It is a Dodge Journey. At some point, did officers on scene become aware that that car had been out driving around at a, at a period in the early morning hours of October 5th, it was after the time that she said she had gone to bed? Yes. Uh, can you tell us how that played out? So the initial officers, um, including the lieutenant, the time Lieutenant Foster, um, relayed information about what was going on at the scene, um, such as the vehicle's tag numbers. Those tag numbers were taken by one of the detectives, uh, still at the office, Detective Robbins, and she ran them in the flock camera system. 
and saw that the vehicles were moving beyond what Ms. Leilani initially said. Specifically the journey. Uh, yes. Uh, what is the flop camera system? Just yeah, it's a, I believe it's like a neighborhood camera system. Um, it basically will take a photograph of a vehicle's license plate as it passes by the camera, and it's stored for law enforcement to later look at. And you can search it by tag? We can. Okay. Um, now, once, did, did that information get back to Foster, that that, that car had been out in the early morning hours of yes. October 5th? Yeah, at this point in time, I'm going to object again. We seem to be getting far afield from a voluntariness question here in order to evidence they wish to submit a trial. So I don't really see the relevance of any of this. I mean, again, I'll just lodge the objection again. Mr. Dean. Now, my very next question is going to be, did Lieutenant Foster go and talk to her about that? Okay. Did Let's she ask her a question, and did she answer it? Let's go there. What does that look like? All of this bears directly on voluntariness. Okay. Um, okay. And I understand they're not trying to suppress that statement. I understand that. But the voluntariness of her statements that day, and it, 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 to contextualize what brought her into the police department and how she was um, receptive of police questioning, it, it, I do think it is important to look at what kicked this investigation off and that she was answering questions willingly on scene and had, in fact, brought the police to her. Okay, Mr. Hillier. Your Honor, when it comes to questions of voluntariness, the questions of voluntariness are simple. Was it a voluntary encounter between the police and the defendant? The context of that encounter is irrelevant. If the defendant is brought to that encounter in handcuffs or not free to leave, then it makes it a custodial encounter. It's just that simple. We don't need to know what they had for lunch. We don't need to know whether or not their car worked. We don't need to know who lived in the house. We just oh. need to know the context of that particular encounter between police and the defendant. Thank you. I'm, I'm going to sustain the objection. All right. Boy, listening to this is taking me back to law school and criminal procedure class. I remember my professor saying it very succinctly. Custody plus interrogation equals the need for Miranda. Right? You know the warnings pursuant to Miranda versus Arizona, custody plus interrogation. You gotta have those two things in order to trigger those warnings that are necessary. Let's talk a little bit more about what is needed. You know, a knowing, intelligent, involuntary statement. What, what do we need in order to get that, to have the admissibility here? We have two great guests to talk about it with us. They both are practicing criminal defense attorneys in the private sector. We have attorney Michael Riley joining us and attorney Matthew Mangina, who also previously served as a district attorney in Pennsylvania. Great to see you both this morning. Okay, uh, Matthew Mangino, I'd love to start with you, please. Kind of take us back to law school. Some of the things we're thinking about here as we analyze what Leilani Simon said and whether or not the court can consider it. Well, Julie, uh, you being a former prosecutor yourself, you hit the nail right on the head. I mean, what we're talking about here when we're dealing with issues of suppression of statements is, was the statement uh, free and voluntary? Was the statement made during a custodial interrogation? And a custodial interrogation is one in which the defendant is not free to leave and is being interrogated, being asked potentially incriminating questions. So how do you determine if a, a, an interrogation is custodial? You know, was the defendant brought to the police station? Uh, in a police car? Was the defendant or the suspect handcuffed? Uh, were they not free to leave? Uh, you know, were they questioned by somebody wearing a police uniform with a badge and a gun? Uh, if it is that type of situation, then the police are responsible for giving those well-known Miranda rights. You have the right to remain silent. You have the right to an attorney. Uh, you have the right, to, uh, you know, not to be interrogated without your attorney being present. And if, the, if that situation exists, that custodial interrogation exists, it's required that that defendant be Mirandized. If she isn't, those statements are subject to suppression. Matthew, thank you kindly for that. A oh boy, excellent explanation right there. And so now let's take it a step further. Michael Riley, so knowing all of that, we've got the premise, we know what the law provides here. Do you think the defense team has a leg to stand on here in possibly getting some of this 
thrown out and not coming before the jury at the time Leilani Simon goes to trial. Thanks, Julie. Um, I do not think that they have a leg to stand on. Um, we're looking at this Miranda inquiry. Was it a custodial interrogation? I agree with everything that's been said so far. There's also this question about voluntariness. Was this a voluntarily made statement by Leilani Simon? And as the prosecutor's pointing out in court, she's, she calls the police, she essentially draws them in, brings them to her house, and uh, gives them this story. And part of that story um, is that she went to bed at midnight and they can show that she's lying about that because there's evidence to show that she was driving around after she uh, told the police she was in bed. So I think that it's very clear that this statement was voluntarily made. And in fact, it sounds like it was made in an effort to cover up her involvement in the death of her son. Exactly, Mike. False statements. You know, she's got a real problem if the statements are coming in and if they're untrue. Uh, very problematic, as you both know, for her as she heads to trial. Uh, may little Quentin Simon get justice. Mike Riley, Matthew Mangino, thank you both. Stand by, please. We're going to hit a break. When we come back, we're going to see the case detective outlining Leilani Simon's demeanor during those interviews after the disappearance of her baby. Her child, she's charged with murdering her own child. And we're going to hear more of those revealing recordings when we come back. We are underway in the trial of doomsday prophet Chad Daybell. Prosecutors say they will seek the death penalty against him. Investigators have recovered human remains at Chad Daybell's residence. There's no way Lori and I should ever come up with this. His wife, Lori Valley Daybell, has already been convicted. Now, will her husband end up with the same fate? It's just so hard to know where the truth ends. It's the doomsday prophet, Chad Daybell, on trial. Welcome back to Court TV Live. I'm Julie Grant. We're talking about defendant Leilani Simon. This woman is accused of murdering her little baby, Quinton Simon. And there was a big pretrial hearing on Tuesday. In the portion of the hearing you're about to see next, prosecutors presented another recorded police interview with Leilani Simon after her 20-month-old baby was reported missing. Now, all throughout this, you know, the first interview, the second interview, talking to her about um, doing this written statement, what sort of tone are y'all thinking? Uh, very casual. Um, at this point, we're just collecting as much information as possible, relaying it to every party that needs to know. Was it at all accusatory? Not at this point. Was anybody raising voices or anything like that? No. Um, the written statement itself was included at States Exhibit 12. Um, now, after the written, the three written statements were done, uh, what did you all as the investigative team do with them? So we all reviewed them as a team um, and spoke with some experts that the FBI had access to to kind of discuss the next steps. You were comparing them to each other? Yes. And I, I suppose with what the writer had actually said in interviews to that point? Yes. Okay. Um, And while you were doing that, she was in the interview room with Officer Carlson, right? I believe so. And at some point when she was in there, uh, she sort of opened up to Officer Carlson about, um, about some of her, her mental health issues. Is that right? Yes. Um, and this is information that she essentially volunteered, correct? It is. Um, and I won't... Um, you know, I suppose because of some of the objections that have been raised at this point, I, I won't publish that part. Um, but let me just ask you this. It starts with her saying to Carlson um, something like, this whole thing will be easier if they come back in so I have someone to talk to. Yes. Something along those lines. Yes. Um, and if you watch that, if the court watches it, uh, the court will see that she was she would she would rather talk to you all than not yes that's sort of the sense that you get from that utterance. it is um, sometime shortly thereafter uh 
she got a visit from from Danny in the interview room. Is that right? Yes. Okay. Uh, if we could please publish State's Exhibit 14. Okay. So the last one was. State's Exhibit 13, I have uh, in the exhibit list as disclosure to Officer Samantha Carlson uh, with the time at which that occurred. Okay, so we're moving now to 14. Okay, you may proceed. Yeah, Chief Burger and me, uh, and that was Paul telling her at the beginning that she has food on the way? I believe so. Okay, good. Okay, so she's not being held incommunicado or anything like that, right? No. Paul is talking to her from the hallway. Mm -hmm. Danny's coming in to see her. Uh, talk about how you took her out for a cigarette. Yes. Um, and sometime shortly after that visit from Danny, she took herself, she showed herself out for a cigarette. She right? does. Uh, and ask Officer Carlson if she wanted to come with her or something along those lines? Yes. Um, if we could publish State's Exhibit 15, please. Okay, please proceed. Do you have a jacket on you? I don't. I was talking about for you, right uh, So you maybe step out there with me while I smoke my cigarette? Yeah. Sure. Is that freezing down there? It feels, feels like somebody's. So she wants to leave, she can leave, and she seems to know that. Yes. <clears throat> Sometime after that, um, you and Snyder interviewed her again in what I'm calling at State's Exhibit 16, CCPD Interview 3, right? Yes. Um, and about how long was this one? About an hour. Uh, what were you all talking to her about this time? So at this point, um, we had confirmation um, that uh, the child's father was at work during the, um, the time frame that we had. Um, at this point, we wanted to have more conversations about this timeline and what could have happened. Okay. Mm, this is disgusting, isn't it? I mean, th this case has just incensed so many people who were invested in bringing little Quentin Simon home when we heard of the disappearance and then... We later find out from police the little baby was put in a dumpster and then wound up in a landfill. And now his mom is going to be on trial for his murder very soon. Um, let's talk a little bit about these facts going before a jury and just how inflamed the members of the jury might be hearing all of this. Let's bring back in our guests, attorneys Matthew Mangino and Michael Riley on the program this morning. Matthew, let me go to you first here. Uh, your thoughts on that, please. Well, yeah, I mean, the, the whole scenario, obviously, it, it's a tragic death, a 20-month-old child. But these statements that are inconsistent, that were made immediately after, uh, you know, which are indicative of a cover-up, which in itself is indicative of consciousness of guilt, these facts are going to be very, uh, are going to weigh heavy on this jury and have a real impact on it. Most definitely, Matthew. And then I'm wondering, might we see Leilani Simon try to get some kind of a plea deal from the state? Michael Riley, I'd love to ask you about that, please. Your thoughts. I certainly think she should explore a plea deal, Julie. I think that these facts are really, really bad. Uh, Quinton was in a, a, a dumpster and then taken to a landfill. His remains found. These are ugly, ugly facts. Um, and I think she should certainly explore the opportunity to take a deal 
and uh, maybe have some hope of getting out of jail at some point in her life. Mm -hmm. I think that would be great advice. I'm with you, Michael. Thank you for that. We've got to leave it there. Hopefully, little Quentin Simon gets justice. And let's remember, April is Child Abuse Awareness Month. I know both of my guests are certainly aware of that. We want to thank them for their time and insight this morning. Michael Riley, Matthew Mangino, always great to have you both on this program. We'll see you soon.